Hello everyone and welcome back to the channel. I hope you all are doing absolutely well. Guys, in this video, we will be practicing a lot of questions which are actual questions from your LTI mind tree assessments. Okay, and if you practice these questions, you will get a complete idea of what sort of questions are coming in your assessments of LTI mind tree. So make sure to attempt all the questions and by the end of this video, I have one DIY question for all of you. So make sure to attempt that and write down its answer in the comment section. So guys, before we start the video, if you are new to the channel, consider subscribing to the channel as I regularly post these kinds of helpful videos. And guys, I am creating a complete playlist on LTI prep. Make sure to check this playlist because a lot more videos are going to come in this playlist. I have already covered few more videos. Make sure to check them also and then more are going to come in, uh, come up in the upcoming future. So guys, without wasting any time, let's get started with the first question. So guys, let's look at this question. The processes P1, P2 and P3 arrive at the same time as shown in the table and are processed using shortest job first SJF scheduling algorithm. Calculate the average waiting time in millisecond. So we are given the processes that is P1, P2, P3 and burst time in milliseconds that is 8, 3 and 5 milliseconds. Okay, so let's try to calculate the average waiting time. So guys, if you are not aware how to solve this type of question, so it is usually done in three steps. So step one is basically uh, to arrange it okay, in, by burst time. So, if you arrange this by burst time, so it will be P2, P3 and P1, okay, because for P2 it is the least, burst time is least and then for P3 it is 5 and then for P1 it is 8. So, first is to arrange as per burst time, okay. Let's move on to step 2. So, step 2 is uh, like calculating the waiting time. So, calculating waiting time. Okay, now how do we calculate the waiting time? See, for P2, how much will be the waiting time? See, P2 is the like the first one, so it does not have to wait, so the waiting time is going to be 0. Now, next comes P3, so for this, the waiting time will be how much? 3, right, because it has to wait for the burst of P2, and next will be your P1. So, how much it has to wait? So, it has to wait for the burst of P P2, like P2 plus P3, right, and until they complete, then only it can complete, right? So, for them, the burst time was uh, 3 and 5. So, it has to wait for 8, okay? 8 milliseconds. Now, step 3 is, step 3 is the final step where what we will do is average waiting time we will calculate, okay? So, average waiting time in order to calculate that, what we need to do is, we need to do this, okay? Like these values that we have got 0, 3 and 8, okay? I will add this, okay? And then I have to calculate the average. So, I will divide it by 3. So, it will be, 11 by 3 which is going to be 3.6 okay so which is our option number a so guys the correct answer for this question will be option number a that is 3.6 let's now move on to the next question so guys let's look at this question the question is a class contains two integers as private numbers two member functions public are defined in it one to add the two integers and another to subtract two integers a programmer wants to add new functionality to enable multiplication of the two numbers which of the given options should be adopted to do this? Let's see the options that we have. Option A is define a third public member function that multiplies the two numbers. Option B is define public member functions to return the value of both the integers and do multiplication with them in the code. By returning the values, any operation can be performed on, the, on them in the future, giving extensibility to the code. Option C is defining a third private member function that multiplies the two numbers and option D is define private member functions to return the values of both the integers and do multiplication with them in the code. Okay. So guys, first of all, let me tell you what is the correct answer for this and we'll then we'll see the explanation. So guys, the correct answer for this question will be option number A. Okay. So see guys, the integers are private members. So outside code cannot directly access them and to perform multiplication, the correct way is to extend the class functionality with a new public member function. So that is why we have selected correct uh, answer okay let's now move on to the next question okay so guys this is the next question that we have let's read the question first and then we will look at the solution see guys the question is code a contains a set of eight lines that occur 10 times in different points of the program this code is passed to a programmer who puts the set of eight lines into a function definition and then calls them at 10 points in program assume this new code to be code b what which code will run faster using interpreter? We have the options as code A, code B, and then the third option is both the codes would run at the same speed, and option D is none of the above. Okay, so guys, the correct answer for this question will be option number B, which is code B. Okay, so the correct answer is code B. See, uh, in code B, what will happen is 
interpreter will interpret the function definition once and then just interpret the function calls at 10 points and it will have less repetition. Therefore, port B will execute faster under interpretation. Uh, interpretation okay. Since function calls are cheaper than repeatedly uh, interpreting the same code. And what happens in the case of code A, interpreter will repeatedly interpret the same 8 lines and this will happen eight, uh, like 10 times for each line. So, that is why uh, it will have 80 lines in total. So, that is why we are not correcting code A because code A will take more time, code B uh, will run faster. Okay. Let us now move on to the next question. Okay, so guys, we have this question. Let us read the question first and then we will select the answer. The question is, a programmer is making a database of animals in a zoo along with their properties. The possible animals are dog, lion and zebra. Each one has attributes herbivorous, color and noc nocturnal. The programmer uses the object-oriented programming paradigm for this. How will the system be conceptualized? Let us see the options that we have. Option A is class animal object, dog, lion and zebra. Data members are herbivorous, color and nocturnal. Option B is class animal object, herbivorous color and nocturnal, data members dog, lion and zebra and we have this uh, option C and then option D is none of the above. So guys, let me straight forward tell you the answer. Okay. The correct answer for this question is option number A. Okay. So guys, in OOPS class define, uh, defines common properties that is attributes or behaviors. Here all the animals share the same attributes that is herbivorous color and nocturnal. Okay. So they should be like data members of a class. The specific animals like dog, lion and zebra are objects of the class animal. So, that is why we have selected the option as correct, uh, correct answer as option number A. Moving on to the next question. The question is, Aprajita wants to make a function that is not bound to any identifier. Which of the given functions should she incorporate in her program? The options are, option A is anonymous function, option B is friend function, option C is null function and option D is global function. So, guys, the correct answer for this question will be option number A, which is anonymous function. Okay. So, what is an anonymous function? Just in case if you are not aware, a function that does not have a name or identifier. So, guys, if you have to write an anonymous function in Python, you write it using this way. Okay. Lambda x, x plus 5. In the same way, in JavaScript, if you have to write an anonymous function, you write it in this way. Function and then directly this parenthesis and then your function definition. You, don't, you basically don't give a name. And in C++, if you have to write uh, this uh, anonymous function, you write it in this way. That is directly brackets and then the ty uh, type of it and then whatever is your code inside that, what that you will write. Basically, in any of the languages, you do not give any name to it. Okay. Let us now move on to the next question. Okay, guys. So, we have this question which is based on the code. Okay. Let us read the question first of all and then we will be attempting it. So, the question is, a stack is implemented as linear array. An array is 0 to n minus 1. A programmer writes the function given below to pop out an element from the stack. And this is the function, function pop, top, n. And if x, it will check top equals to top minus 1, else it will print under flow. And then it will return top. So the uh, question is, what should substitute the condition x? And we have the options that is given to us. Top is less than n minus 1, top is less than n, top is greater than 1, top is greater than equals to 0. So, guys, in this case, the correct answer for this question will be option number D, which is top is greater than or equals to 0. Okay. See, guys, let us understand what is happening. So, in a stack, pop operation removes the top element that we have to understand. And underflow happens when the stack is already empty. That is when top value becomes minus, minus 1. Okay. So, when this condition occurs, we say that uh, underflow is happening. So, to perform pop, we need to check that the stack is not empty. Right. So, that is why we have selected this as the correct answer that we will check this condition that if our top value is greater than or equals to 0 which means we are checking if our uh, st stack is not empty okay let's now move on to the next question so guys the next question that we have is this one how many nodes in a tree with n nodes have no ancestors and we have the options as 0 1 2 and log n so guys the correct answer for this question will be option number b which is 1 okay so basically in a t an ancestor of a node is any node on the path from root to that node. Okay. The root node has no ancestors since nothing comes before it, right? We know the structure of a tree, right? How it is A, then we have B and C. So for root node, we can say that there is no ancestors, right? And every other node, n, min, uh, n minus 1 nodes has at least one ancestor to the root, right? Therefore, the number of nodes with no ancestors is exactly one, which is only the root node, okay? Because any other road, uh, any other node which will come below will have at least one, right? Even this second level, 
दिस नोड्स विल ऑल्सो हैव एटलीस्ट वन पेरेंट और एन सिस्टर विच इज ए राइट बट ओनली द रूट नोड इज द ओनली वन विच इज समथिंग लाइक विच डू नॉट हैव एनी एनी एन सिस्टर नेक्स्ट मूवमेंट टू द नेक्स्ट क्वेश्चन नाउ द क्वेश्चन इज हाउ मेनी नोट्स डज द फुल बाइनरी ट्री विद एन लीव्स कंटेन्स द ऑप्शन आर टू एन प्लस वन लॉग टू एन नोट्स एंड देन नेक्स्ट क्वेश्चन नेक्स्ट लॉग बेस टू एन नोट्स नेक्स्ट इज टू एन माइनस वन नोट एंड द फाइनल वन इज टू एन नोट ओके द करेक्ट आंसर फॉर दिस क्वेश्चन गाइज विल बी ऑप्शन नंबर सी दैट इज टू एन माइनस वन नोट ओके लेट्स अंडरस्टैंड व्हाट हैपेंस इन दिस केस अ फुल बाइनरी ट्री इज अ बाइनरी ट्री इन विच एवरी नोड इज आइदर जीरो और टू चिल्ड्रन ओके लेट्स सी द एग्जाम्पल सो दिस इज अ फुल बाइनरी ट्री एग्जाम्पल ओके दिस इज अ फुल बाइनरी ट्री एग्जाम्पल इन द सेम वे देर इज दिस एग्जाम्पल विच ऑल्सो इज एग्जाम्पल ऑफ फुल बाइनरी ट्री वाई सो सी दिस इज नॉट अ फुल बाइनरी ट्री ओके this case is not a full binary tree because it should either have two children or no children okay so in a full binary tree if the number uh, of leaf node is equals to n then the number of internal nodes will be n minus 1 so total nodes okay let me tell you the formulas okay there are formulas for this case so total nodes will be leaf node okay plus internal nodes okay and uh, in this case uh, like leaf nodes we are considering to be n then the internal nodes will be n minus 1 okay so that is why it will be 2n minus 1 okay let's now move on to the next question so guys we have this question which is again a code based question let's understand this and then we will attempt this so the question is consider the code given below how many times will hello be printed if m is less than n and exactly one of m or n is even so we have this code which is for i equals to m to n increment 2 and print hello and we have this options given to us so guys in order to save time i will directly tell you the option okay which is option d this is the correct option for this question okay and basically in this question what will happen is loop will run from i equals to m to i equals to n okay this is happening in this case okay that the loop will run with step size of 2 because it is told to us that uh, loop increment is 2 so it prints once for every alternate integer string starting from m until it crosses n okay so for every alternate it will print and the condition that is given to us is exactly one of m or n is even so one case can be m is even and n is odd right case one can be what m is even and n is odd and the second case will be the vice versa okay you can understand m is odd and uh, n is even okay so the formula for number of terms in an arithmetic progression is something like this okay m m plus 2 uh, and then uh, we have m plus 4 okay because it is an this one right alternate one it it will go till n okay so the count will become n minus m divided by 2 plus 1 okay if you further like solve it so if so we will consider the first case where m is even so the count will become what n minus m Plus one divided by two, okay. When m is even, and the second case is when m is odd, okay. So in that case, the like count will be one plus n minus m divided by two, okay. So based on this, we are selecting option number D, which is n minus m plus two. Uh, sorry, not plus, but but divided by two if m is even, and one plus n by n minus m divided by two if m is odd, okay. So that is why the correct option for this question will be option number D. So guys, let's now see the final question. So guys, we have practiced a lot of questions so far, and now I have one question for all of you, and this is a DIY question. DIY is in do-it-yourself question. Okay, so you need to like attempt this question and write down its answer in the comment section. I will not be telling you the answer of it. Okay, and guys, if you have watched the video so far, make sure to attempt this question and write down the answer in the comment section. The question is, which of the following is a valid identifier in most programming languages like C, Java, Python? and we have the options are as option a two variable option b my underscore variable option c four and option d is total dash value so guys make sure to attempt it and write down the answer in the comment section so that's all for today guys i hope you found the video helpful if you have any doubts please let me know in the comment section make sure to join me on telegram and instagram as well you can ask your queries in the instagram dm as well and if you need any content you can request it on your on our telegram channel make sure to subscribe to the channel if you haven't done yet to receive all the latest regular updates i regularly post off campus drives and preparation related videos for placements on my channel so that's all for today's video thanks for watching the video